Hello everyone, I'm the Dungeon Doctor and welcome to the latest in my Monk Masterclass series. We're into the home stretch now as we look at The Way of Mercy Monk. Released in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, this is widely regarded as the only good monk subclass. This is actually why I've held off creating a build for it for so long. When I started this Monk Masterclass series, and indeed this channel, it was with a view to shining a spotlight on the underrated classes and subclasses in the game of D&D 5e. And with this subclass, I wondered, was there really going to be a challenge in optimizing it? Would there even be any value in showing people how to do it? Well, the only way to find out is to review the subclass, so without further ado, let's look at the Way of Mercy Monk's third level features. At level 3, we gain the feature Implements of Mercy, granting us proficiency in Insight, Medicine and Herbalism kits. We also gain a special mask, and we have a few suggestions of the form this could take, including something blank and white, or a butterfly, or a raven, evoking this image of a plague doctor. The extra proficiencies are nice, and actually fit the flavour of a doctor really well. They also align well with the monk's High Wisdom modifier. And if we have access to the rules on how to use herbalism kits in Sanifar's Guide to Everything, then we could potentially use our proficiency in them to make healing potions during our downtime. The mask is cool, I guess, but it's entirely there for aesthetics. It doesn't do anything mechanically. I think someone might have been re-watching Season 1 of Critical Role when they were designing this subclass. Hashtag Way of Mercy Percy. We also gain the features Hands of Healing and Hands of Harm. With Hands of Healing, we can spend one key point and an action to heal a creature of a number of hit points equal to our Wisdom modifier plus a roll of our Martial Arts die. Alternatively, when we use Flurry of Blows, we can forgo one of our unarmed strikes we make and replace it with the use of this ability, without spending an extra key point. The Hands of Healing ability is... weird. But I'll allow it. Out of combat, we can use this to heal ourselves and allies. This is great if we're taking a short rest and want to use up any remaining key points we have just healing people, as we'll get them all back after the short rest. When we're in combat though, the most efficient way to use this ability is as part of us attacking. In order to use Flurry of Flows, we must use our attack action first. This suggests our character is focused on both attack and support. I've heard it suggested that we could use this feature to top up our hit points when we're in the front lines, letting us fill a tank role. Now, it's true that one of the reasons that monks are so bad at tanking is because they're low hit points, so self-healing could help with that. But it's not the only reason. Monks also have a low armour class, or at least they do until they reach very high levels and their unarmoured defence catches up. And other than deflect missiles, monks don't really have ways to mitigate damage against them. They can use patient defense for tanking as well, but that also costs key and a bonus action, so it competes with the Hands of Healing ability, both in terms of action economy and resource cost. I think people with this tanking fantasy for the subclass have the expectation that they're going to charge into battle and use flurry of blows round after round to heal themselves. But actually, it'll play out more like this. Two in one. The monk charges into to attack a creature. The monk has full hit points, so there's no reason yet to use Hands of Healing. They might use Flurry of Blows, or save their key to use Hands of Healing on the next turn. A round passes, and they've taken a beating from the creature they just engaged. So to heal themselves, they use Flurry of Blows to recover on average about 5 hit points, or maybe 6 points after level 5. Another round passes. They take a beating from that monster they engage because they didn't take the dodge action and their armor class isn't terribly high. And then we come to the third round. It's the monk's turn again and they'd really like to use Flurry of Blows again to get some healing, but they can't because they're already down and they're making death saving throws. Self-healing sounds great on paper, except your extra hit points are always going to lag behind the damage you're taking. Because of this, I feel like the best way to use the Hands of Healing ability is to support another frontliner. A frontliner with better hit points, better armor class, and maybe the tools to mitigate damage, such as the Barbarian's Rage. The healing we can do will go much further if we can apply it to characters who are designed to fill the tank role. Also, Hands of Healing can be used to efficiently raise a character from zero hit points. Even the smallest bit of healing can do that. So that's actually even more incentive for our monk to prioritize their self-preservation. If we're in a party with at least one good tank, 
then this monk should really be combining hit and run attacking with hit and run support. We're not Wolverine, capable of regenerating health quicker than it could be dealt against us. We're a doctor, a field medic, a damn fine one at that. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a barbarian. Meanwhile, with Hands of Harm, we can, once per turn, spend one key point to add necrotic damage to an unarmed strike that has hit a creature. The damage is equal to one roll of our martial arts die, plus our wisdom modifier. This feels similar to how the Way of Four Elements can get a smite-like ability through the Fangs for the Fire Snake discipline. However, Hands of Harm is more limited because we can only use the feature once per turn. In some ways, it's better to use this ability instead of Flurry of Blows, because when we hit a creature with an unarmed strike, we can guarantee we're getting that extra damage. But the net benefit of using Hands of Harm over Flurry of Blows is pretty small. I'd be tempted to wait for a critical hit to use this ability so we can get the most out of the extra damage, but even then, it's not that much extra damage, since it only scales with our martial arts die. Because of this, I don't feel like Hands of Harm actually gives us that much which the base monk didn't already have, at least not in this level. Although I suppose we could combine it with Flurry of Blows for some expensive burst damage. Overall, I like the features that we get at level 3, but we should remember that when we've run out of key, we effectively no longer have a third level feature outside of our skill proficiencies. And with Hands of Healing, we're trading an unarmed strike for the healing we get, so we actually need to make sure that the value we're getting out of that healing is better than what we would have gotten if we had just made the unarmed strike. With that unarmed strike, we could potentially down a creature quicker, for example, and really that's probably going to be more effective in battle than doing a small bit of healing. Let's see what we get at level 6. At level 6, we gain Physician's Touch, which grants us an extra effect whenever we use Hands of Healing or Hands of Harm. Now when we use Hands of Healing, we can end a disease or one of the following status effects that are affecting a creature. Blinded, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. This is a fantastic feature, as now for the cost of one key point, we're effectively gaining the benefits of a lesser restoration spell. So this monk is really leaning into that support role. Technically, we could apply this to ourselves, potentially letting us fill a tank roll better, but we won't be able to end the paralyzed or stunned condition on us, as we won't be able to take an action to use the Hands of Healing ability. And we'd only end the blinded or poisoned effects on ourselves after we've used our extra attack feature already, since the most efficient way to use Hands of Healing is after we've already made attacks that turn. And so we'd be making those initial attacks with disadvantage. It's kind of like the healing is lagging behind when we really need it. So again, Hands of Healing really feels like it's working best when we're applying it to other creatures. Meanwhile, Hands of Harm got a lot better. Now when we use Hands of Harm on a creature, they are affected by the poisoned condition until the end of our next turn. I've seen arguments that this lets the monk lean into the tank row, as this puts an enemy's attacks against them at disadvantage. Personally though, I think this misses the real value of this feature. We could already reliably put attacks against us at disadvantage by taking the dodge action using patient defense. This doesn't require we hit a creature, and it would apply to all attacks being made against us, which is potentially better if we are being attacked by multiple creatures in a round. And as a small added benefit, we'd have advantage on any dexterity checks that we make until the start of our next turn. On the other hand though, hand... <laughs> hand. Hands of Harm does deliver some extra damage to the creature we hit, so we could see it as a halfway house between tanking and attacking. But really, I see the true value of this ability is again in supporting a real tank. Giving a creature disadvantage to hit any of our allies, especially those with already high armor class, is much more valuable. There's also the question of whether this feature is actually better than attempting to use Stunning Strike. I think in cases where the creature is focused on making attack rolls and the ally they're targeting has a good armor class, I'm talking uh, 19 or higher, the poison condition can be just as useful as stunned. Effectively, that creature is going to waste their action economy by attacking a character that they just can't hit. And the poison condition is more reliable since there's no requirement that the creature make a saving throw against it. However, against a creature who doesn't have a high constitution score and is causing creatures to take damage through saving throws, so for example a spellcaster, 
then Stunning Strike is definitely the better option. The level 6 features are very powerful, and for me, this is where the Mercy Monk actually gets good. But my thoughts about what role this monk should fill haven't really changed. They're not there to tank. They're there to support the tank and the rest of the party. <sighs> Calm down, Peter. At level 11, we gain Flurry of Harm and Healing. With this, we get a couple of effects. Firstly, whenever we use Flurry of Blows, we can replace both the attacks we will have made with the use of Hands of Healing. At this level, we have a D8 Martial Arts type, so it's the equivalent of using a first level Cure Wounds twice as a bonus action. That's really potent, and from this level onwards, I can finally start to see the potential for this monk to fill that tank row. At this level, we could have an armor class of 18, and then at level 12, even a 19 armor class, so finally, I can start to see the logic in us relying on self-healing to keep us going in that row. But if that healing is the impact we're having on our row as a tank, just imagine how much more impactful it would be if we were applying it to a real tank, like a barbarian. We'd be able to give them maybe 19 hit points of healing on an average turn, which with resistance to damage is going to let them absorb about 40 hit points of damage that round. That's really potent. The second effect that we gain is that when we use Flurry of Blows, we can apply the Hand of Harm effect to one of the attacks for free. So potentially we could use both Hands of Harm and Hands of Healing once per turn, just for the cost of one key point. That's really efficient for our key. But keep in mind this does assume we hit with Hands of Harm with our first unarmed strike that we make. So we might have to forgo the Hand of Healing effect on our second attack, if we've missed it and we really want to land that poison effect. We could also think of this feature as a way to gain the effects of Hands of Harm for free by just using Flurry of Blows, but if we really want to land a poison condition on a creature, there's a risk that if we're relying on Flurry of Blows landing it, that we'll miss our opportunity. For this reason, it actually might be more beneficial to use Hands of Harm on one of our initial attacks with our extra attack feature. That way we aren't leaving it to chance, we're definitely landing it on them. Level 11 is a big spike in power for the Way of Mercy Monk. They're now way more efficient with their use of key, and so I can see them being capable of using both Hands of Healing and Hands of Harm each turn without much problem. I still think they're more valuable as a supporter, but with just how much healing they can deliver to themselves, and with how their armor class should be around 18 by this level, I can start to see the potential for them to fill a secondary role as a tank. Although, to anyone wanting to fill that role with a Way of Mercy Monk, I would suggest using both Patient Defense and Flurry of Blows for the Hands of Healing effect, as often spending our key and bonus action to put attacks against us at disadvantage is going to be more beneficial for our survival. Between level 11 and the Way of Mercy's next subclass feature, we'd pick up the Diamond Soul feature. I wouldn't normally mention this, but for a monk which is trying to fill the tank role, this is really crucial. Being able to reliably make saving throws is actually something a lot of tanks struggle with, thinking particularly barbarians and fighters. The only real exception to that rule is a paladin. So again, at high levels, I really can see the potential for us filling that tank role more and more. And finally, at level 17, we gain the feature Hand of Ultimate Mercy. With this, we can use an action to bring a dead creature back to life, provided they died less than 24 hours ago. In addition, they'll regain 4d10 plus our wisdom modifier in hit points, and if they're affected by any of the status condition Hands of Healing can usually cure, then those effects will go away too. This feature costs 5 key points to use, and once we've used it, we can't use it again until we finish a long rest. Essentially, this is like an improved version of Revivify. The time limit is way more forgiving. With 24 hours, we could even afford to take either a long or short rest to recover our key points before using it a second time. So for example, if we've just had a climactic battle with the big bad of a campaign, but lost two allies, provided they aren't disintegrated, we have the tools to bring back one of them before our long rest, and the second one after our long rest, because that would all be within 24 hours. Might cause some arguments between the players, depending on who you decide to raise from the dead first, though. 
Not only this, but the extra healing we grant these characters with this feature means that they should hopefully be able to take at least one more hit before they are knocked out again. This is in stark contrast with Revivify, where a character will actually just come back with one hit point, so they could easily be knocked unconscious again, or maybe even dead again if the damage is really severe. Overall, this is a fantastic ability to gain at 17th level, and a welcome way to cap off the support that this monk has been providing throughout the campaign. That being said, it is a little late into a campaign to gain the ability to bring creatures back from the dead, so hopefully up to this point we've had another character who's had something like Revivify for those situations. So, what are my overall thoughts? Like the way of the Ascendant Dragon, this monk gets way better at higher levels of play, which is great because actually that's one of the biggest complaints that people tend to have about the monk class, that it really scales badly, particularly after level 6. But I can't agree with people who call this monk a tank, at least not until they reach very high levels of play, probably level 12 onwards. And in my videos, I tend to assume that most people aren't playing at those high levels, at least not for a significant amount of time. The typical campaign actually runs between levels 1 and 12, in fact. What I do see, though, is a great support character who would do really well at healing allies and debuffing enemies while using hit and run tactics to preserve themselves in the interest of keeping the whole party going. Like with my review of the Ascendant Dragon Monk, let's talk about how I'd actually go about making a straight classed Mercy Monk. Firstly, I'd really want to ensure they have a way to move in and out of melee easily, so picking up the mobile feat or crusher would be key to this monk. We could pick up either of these feats at level 1 with Variant Human, but we would also maybe consider classes like Bugbear, whose extra reach can give them the same benefits. It's also tempting to pick up a class like Harangon or Goblin, who can disengage as a bonus action, but this will compete with the Flurry of Blows and Hands of Healing features. Overall, I actually think Mobile would be the best feat to go for, as the extra movement makes up for the fact that this monk needs to be in touching distance to apply either Hands of Healing or Hands of Harm. And because we'll be using Hands of Healing as part of our Flurry of Blows, we'll always have that last attack action to attempt to attack a creature, and then get the free disengage away from them. So yeah, I'd probably pick up Mobile either at level 1 with Variant Human, or with our first ability score increase. After this, the progression of this build is simple. With each ability score increase we get, we'd want to boost either Wisdom or Dexterity, until we have both of them maxed out. We're probably better off boosting Wisdom first, as with Flurry of Blows, we'll be making many attacks each turn, and this will make up for our slightly lower accuracy. Once we get to level 6, we should be trying to land Hand of Harm or Stunning Strike on the biggest threat on the battlefield, choosing one of these depending on what kind of creature we're facing. In addition to this, we should be proactively healing our tanks and curing characters when needed, all while keeping ourselves out of danger. Any creatures we've poisoned, we should also consider knocking prone. Because of this, having the athletic skill on this build would be really helpful. Even if we've got a very low strength score, if we're giving those creatures disadvantage on their ability checks, there's a good chance that we'll still be able to knock them prone or push them into an obstacle or similar. After level 12, I think we can afford to stay in the danger zone a bit longer, backing up the tank characters more. And actually, that finishes the build. There's really very little to add after that. I'd say that once we've maxed out our Wisdom and Dexterity, we should maybe pick up the Tough Feet. That way we can lean into that tank role a bit more at those higher levels, but otherwise, very simple. Like with all straight monks, we can probably afford to pick up one feat early into the campaign, but after this there isn't much to talk about since we're going to be so focused on picking up ability scores. And I can see how this monk would be really fun to play, as the Hands of Healing and Harm ability gives them a lot of interesting tools not available to most martial characters. However, there's one glaring problem with this build. I wonder if anyone else has seen it yet. Oh wait, I'll give you a couple of seconds to guess. Maybe put it in the comments below uh, if you've worked it out before I've said it. Bum, ba, 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 ba. Ba ba ra 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 da ra 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 dum da ra da ra da da dum ba ba ra ba ra ra ba. The answer is, what do we do if our party doesn't have a tank? In that situation, we actually won't have a character that we're focused on supporting. Well, dear viewers, to hear the answer to that, 
you're going to have to wait for the next video, where I'll be presenting the build I like to call The Way of No Mercy. I'll see you all then. Ah, crap baskets, I forgot the call to action. If you enjoy this content, please do like, subscribe, comment below. I love reading your comments and responding to them and engaging with you. So please keep doing those great things that our small channels really like. And I look forward to seeing you in the build video next week. Cheers. Look at that beautiful jumper. It's glorious, isn't it? My son got me this Christmas jumper last year. So flashy.